Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Pravin Rokaya. I'm the science coordinator of the Global Water Futures Core Modeling and Forecasting Team. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you today uh, to this special webinar on numerical issues in land models. Uh, today we have Professor Martin Clark, Professor Ray Spiteri, Dr. Reza Zolfagari, and Janine He, uh, all from University of Saskatchewan with us. Uh, today's talk is very unique uh, in the sense it showcases synergies and cross-cutting collaborations uh, between the Global Water Futures core modeling team and, uh, and the computer and core computing team, and also highlights some of the fundamental numerical issues in our land models. I believe after this talk, uh, many of us will pause our moral calibration exercise and rethink about moral physics and numerics. Uh, without taking much time, I want to thank, uh, kick off this webinar by thanking all the speakers uh, for graciously accepting our request uh, to share some of their knowledge, experience, and expertise. The webinar today would be about 45 minutes of presentation, uh, followed by 15 minutes of question and answer session. Uh, Martin, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Thanks, Prabhin. Let me share my screen. Um... Okay, perfect. So I assume that you can you can see everything okay? Yes. Yep, okay, great. Um, yeah, so thanks, Prabhin. Um, the purpose for this webinar was to talk about some work that's kind of cross-cutting between core modeling and core computing um, that doesn't fit neatly into any, any of the themes in core modeling. So we wanted to provide more awareness of this work. Um, so I'm going to provide a few introductory slides to start with um, to, pro to provide some context. And then Ray is going to be talking about um, some of his work and his interests. And then um, Reza will talk about um, some of the work that he's doing in his postdoc. And um, Janine will talk a little bit about some of the work that she's doing in her master's thesis. So to outline, I'm going to um, start with some basic introductions to talk about the modeling process, the construction of a model, um, and why we, why we need to worry about numerics when we've got so many other problems, and then talk about some of the laugh tests that we've um, developed for land models. In terms of the modeling process, um, there's a number of, a number of different steps. So often, you know, when we're thinking about modeling, we're starting with our perceptual model. So that's our understanding of the Earth system. Um, and the perceptual models can be different for different people based on their training, um, the experience, where they've done field work, et cetera. There's no need for um, equations at this stage. This is really just our description of the processes that we think are important in the catchment that we're modeling. Um, the next stage is a conceptual model. So that requires synthesis and simplification of the perceptual model. Um, it requires um, specifying system boundaries, relevant input, state variables and outputs, physical laws to be obeyed, simplifying assumptions. So typically, you know, your conceptual model may be the box and arrow diagrams that you see in papers um, showing the major um, storages of water in the system um, and the fluxes of water in the system. And different conceptual models can um, represent different hypotheses of system behavior. And then we um, can develop the symbolic models. So those are the differential equations um, that, we, that we use and the flux parameterizations that we use in our model. Um, in principle, there's still no ne need for a computer at this stage. You know, you could write all of your differential equations and your flux parameterizations down on paper, you know, if you wanted to. Um, but really where we're focused here is the numerical model. So that's where we're implementing the equations on the computer um, defining the spatial discretization, the time stepping schemes. And this is really the essential step um, to produce numerical simulations of stream flow. Um, so often, you know, for the work that we're doing across um, with, with, with Ray's group, um, for the most part, we're assuming um, that we know what the differential equations are and we're more focused on the implementation of those differential equations. Of course, this process is circular. Um, we're, um, we're looking at our model predictions from a numerical model, and we may use our model predictions to refine our perceptual model, our conceptual model, and um, to refine the model equations. 
and ideally um, um, following the scientific method. So this is a figure from a paper that we published in Water Resources Research in 2016 on the theoretical underpinnings of hydrological models. So this is just um, presenting the information in a different way, where we may formulate a theory to explain the hydrological phenomena, formulate and encode hypotheses as falsifiable predictions, collect data to test predictions, so those can be in research watersheds, new experiments, large sample databases, etc. Confront predictions with observations and then um, um, modify, reject hypotheses, models, data and methods, etc. So this, this is really where we're all about and um, um, we're focused on the numerical aspect of um, this modeling problem in this particular talk. So when we're thinking about how we construct a model, I'll go through some basics so that I can um, really uh, talk about the meat of what we're doing. Um, um, a model's got many, many different ingredients. So state equations, flux parameterizations, um, parameter values, and forcing data. Um, so the state equations, um, the, the state variables represent storage, could be mass, energy, et cetera and the state equations evolve the storage over time. So state at time t is a function of states at the previous times. Um, the flux parameterizations represent energy exchange and transport, um, normally the rate of flow of a property per unit area, and they only depend on quantities at time t. So you're um, estimating the flux often, you know, based at the state variables at time t. And the rate of change of a state um, is determined by the fluxes at the boundaries of a model control volume. Um, the parameter values are the typically time invariant coefficients within the flux parameterizations, and the forcing data is the meteorological data used for model input. So I'll go, go through these um, so that we're all on the same page. I'm going to start um, with a temperature index snow model. Um, so, so there, um, this is this is more for didactic purposes than anything than anything else. I don't think any of us would actually use a temperature index snow model in our own research. Um, so here um, we've got S, which is um, so the storage, the snow water equivalent. The change in the snow water equivalent with time is equal to accumulation minus melt. So the state variable is the snow storage, and the fluxes are accumulation and melt. Um, we have flux parameterizations where accumulation may be equal to precipitation if the air temperature is above a threshold and zero if it's not. Um, the melt can be zero if the air temperature is below a threshold, and it can be an empirical function of temperature if the temperature is above that threshold. So there, um, precipitation and temperature are the forcing data. Um, um, kappa is a model parameter, and um, T sub F is a physical constant. It's freezing point of pure water. And the numerical solution is simple in this case because the fluxes don't depend on the state variables. If we have a slightly different example. If we've got a simplified state equation for the catchment water balance, where the change in storage with time is equal to precipitation minus evapotranspiration minus base flow. Um, the state variable is the catchment storage. Um, model forcing is the precipitation rate. And evapotranspiration and um, base flow are the model fluxes. So we've got flux parameterizations where evapotranspiration um, may be equal to um, 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 the potential ET scaled by the storage, you know, when it's um, um, below the plant stress. Um, so here the plant stress um, is a model parameter. Um, for base flow is um, some type of um, transmission coefficient, hydraulic conductivity. Um, in terms of storage over the maximum storage um, to some exponent. So we've got the base flow exponent, the maximum storage, and the hydraulic conductivity, which are all model parameters. And then the numerical solution, we need to be careful in this case because the model fluxes depend on the state variables. So with that as background, and this is what we're, what we're really getting to, um, as we can think of that and, and define a, a clean and robust way to construct models, so we can define the model state equations as the, as the change in storage with time is equal to the, um, the fluxes at the, at the boundaries of, of the model control volumes. So um, G is going to be like the, um, the flux function you know, that we've got. Um, so the average flux over the interval, um, going from um, the start of the time step to the end of the time step, um, can be um, defined by this integral here. 
you can compute the average flux using very, very small sub-steps, but this is computationally expensive, so often alternative approximations are used. And the numerical approximation that we use controls the stability, accuracy, smoothness, and efficiency of the solution. So given an estimate of the average flux, um, we can um, update the model state variables where um, the state at the end of the time step is equal to the state at the start of the time step um, times the um, flux and um, uh, multiplied by the length of the time step. So this is, this is really, really critical here um, to formulate in this way um, because we've separated um, the physics from the numerical solution. So as hydrologists, we can worry about um, what goes in um, to the G function and numerical analysts such as Ray and Razor um, can worry about how to obtain S. Um, so in doing things in these ways, um, we're able to take advantage of decades of progress in applied mathematics um, to um, address some of the numerical problems that we have in our hydrological models. So then the uh, question is, well, what's actually done in practice? So this is a very, very simple land model. Um, and we've got conservation equations. We can define conservation equations that can be solved elegantly, at least in principle. So change in storage in the Vado zone with time is equal to precipitation minus surface runoff minus evaporation minus the recharge um, from the um, Vado zone to the saturated zone. And the change in storage in the saturated zone is equal to the recharge minus base flow. Right? So, you know, we can, we can, we can do this. Um, but then let's, for fun, um, look at a, um, the model that's used operationally for streamflow forecasting in the USA. Um, so here, um, geeking out on you a little bit and you know, showing you some source code. Um, so I'm highlighting different aspects of the model where you know it kind of looks as if it's written in Fortran 66. You know, lots of go-to statements. You know, stuff like that. Um, but check the label 241 where the um, unsaturated zone free water content is equal to the unsaturated zone free water content minus perk. So perk is, you know, the percolation in this case. Um, so no definition of the time step. Um, here it's assumed that um, um, the um, time step is of like length one, or, you know, something like that. Um, so then um, we go later in the code, well, you know, that's the state update here, you know, later on the code, you know, oh, we've got another state update um, later in the code, you know, another state update and, you know, it goes, uh, goes on and on and on. So um, we've got a lot of spaghetti here and this is, this is problematic um, um, because we, what we see is that the state updates are sprinkled through the source code like confetti at a wedding and the physical representations are intertwined um, with the um, with the numerical solution, so we don't have the clear separation of the physics from the numerics that I showed on the previous slide. Um, the numerical solution is difficult to understand. You know, it's some type of operator splitting. Um, the time step's not even defined explicitly, and um, the numerical solution, time evolution of model states. Um, does not take advantage of decades of progress in applied mathematics. Um, so we can't, you know, take a, um, a third party solver that people have developed in um, um, the applied math community and um, plonk it into this model because, you know, the physics and the numerics are, are intertwined. So the point is that we can and we, and we should do better than this. So years ago, uh, um, along with some colleagues, I developed the SUMA model. Um, um, which is a um, more modular way to construct models. Um, that's got a hierarchical topology um, where we've got model architecture at the center, which is the selection and arrangement of the state variables. We've got model parameterizations, which are functions to describe the relationship between model states and model fluxes, and the model parameters, the adjustable coefficients and the model equations, you know, moving from the in, inside um, to the outside. So that's consistent with what I showed in the previous slides. Um, the numerical considerations is that the representation of physical processes is cleanly separated from the numerical solution. So we've got a global solver in the middle there that manages the temporal integration of the model state variables. And that does enable the use of third party solvers and hence enables benefiting from the progress in solving numerical um, differential equations in the applied math community. 
Um, so this has been something that's been in SUMA since it was published, you know, a, a long time ago. Um, but it wasn't until I moved to the University of Saskatchewan that we had an opportunity to collaborate with Ray and Ray's group and begin to say, well, okay, how can we begin to address um, some of these numerical issues and land models um, a little bit more effectively? So a question then is why worry about numerics when we've got so many other problems? You know, there's lots of lots of uncertainties in the model. And you know, should should we really worry about the numerical solution? We had a commentary on this um, published about 10 years ago in the hydrological processes. Um, and it's a, we were highlighting a surprisingly common model implementation. So this is similar to what I showed with the operational model that's used by the National Weather Service River Forecast Centers in the US. So there, you know, we're looping through, um, we've got an estimate of the outflow flux. So this is, you know, a, 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 a simple um, base flow parameterization. And, you know, we're updating the storage. So the, um, so the storage um, is equal to the storage at the start of the time step, plus, you know, some inflow um, minus, minus the outflow. And again, you know, the time step is not defined explicitly. So the units in these equations don't, don't really work out. Um, when you look at um, the explicit Euler representation, which is similar to what's in that um, pseudo code block there, um, this is just running the model um, to steady state um, with um, different um, precipitation inputs. Um, you can see that there's a lot of numerical instabilities, um, which are completely avoidable if you, if you used um, more robust um, numerical methods. So we looked at this in more detail in our um, 2010 papers. This is going back. And um, here, um, we were looking at some of the impacts of um, poor numerical solutions on model simulations. What I'm showing here is um, some two-dimensional objective functions, um, um, two-dimensional map of the nash Sutcliffe's um, efficiency um, measure. Um, where we're varying two parameters, you know, one's the surface runoff exponent and the second is, you know, the upper zone storage. Um, the left plot is solved using the explicit Euler method and the right plot is solved using the implicit Euler method. And we can see here with the explicit Euler method, there's um, large macro scale discontinuities and large um, numerical errors um, that are contaminating the solution, um, which means that the optimal parameter value is um, really um, not where it should be. We're not able to um, get into the optimum that we want. Um, because of the numerical errors. So we're um, stuck with a model where we've got inappropriate parameter values that are compensating um, for um, weaknesses in the numerical solution. If we compare this to um, an adaptive substepping near exact solution that we obtain um, with an adaptive sub substepping method, we can see that the implicit Euler method is, is close um, to the near exact solution. If we look at um, some um, one-dimensional cross-sections. Um, um, the top is um, um, for the full model, um, showing the blue is implicit Euler, um, the black is um, the adaptive sub-stepping solution, and the red is um, the um, explicit Euler method. You know, the red is terrible, um, but when we look at some of the adaptive sub-stepping solutions, um, we can see that there's some micro-scale discontinuities there that are caused um, by slightly different number of sub-steps taken in neighboring parameter sets, and that can that can complicate the use of um, gradient-based optimization methods. Um, the bottom plots are just zoom-ins of, um, of the top plot um, to emphasize some of those micro-scale discontinuities that we can get from adaptive sub-stepping methods. Um, and this um, contaminates almost every aspect of um, model analysis and application. Um, what I'm showing here is um, 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 differences in sensitivity um, as calculated for the SOBOL method um, for um, 12 basins across the United States. Um, the x-axis is the true sensitivity um, where we used um, an adaptive method with tight error tolerances and the, and the y-axis is the sensitivity that we get um, from um, different fixed step methods like the fixed step explicit Euler um, in the red and the fixed step implicit Euler in the blue. And um, we're seeing that the um, differences in sensitivity um, um, that we get um, just by the choice of the numerical method are enormous. So the macro scale discontinuities that we get in the um, explicit Euler method are um, contaminating the results that we get from the model sensitivity analysis. 
Um, we also have um, problems and more complex models. So here's here's an example here. This is um, this is one dimensional representation of the Zuma model, and um, Ray's is going to um, talk about this in a little bit more detail. We've got four subdomains: the canopy airspace, vegetation canopy, snow and soil, and two state equations: one for thermodynamics, you know, one for hydrology. If we look at the conservation equations for energy and mass. We've got, um, this is starting with um, defining things in terms of enthalpy. We've got the change in enthalpy with time is equal to um, the change in flux with height um, plus some flux sink terms. Um, change in um, mass um, with time is equal to um, the um, change in um, the ice component of, of the um, mass flux with height and the liquid component of the um, mass flux with height and then any mass sink terms like the ET sink or the base flow sink, you know, things like that. Um, um, enthalpy here is defined as internal energy, so um, that can be viewed as an energy deficit. Um, so that's the amount of energy that's required to um, bring the system to, to a reference temperature. So there's the temperature component of enthalpy and the phase change component of enthalpy. So that's just the energy required um, to um, bring the system um, to a reference temperature um, for each of the individual constituents, um, um, where the ice constituents can be the volumetric fraction of ice, um, liquid water, air, soil particles, you know, things like that, and the sum of the volumetric fraction of the individual constituents, you know, sum to one. Um, um, the uh, heat equation um, can be written. Um, um, it can be derived from the enthalpy equation. So here we've got um, the enthalpy equation uh, where we've separated out the temperature and phase change terms on the left-hand side um, and, and the sum of the um, temperature components of enthalpy. Um, it's, it's just the um, um, associated with the volumetric fraction of the um, individual constituents. Now, if we um, um, differentiate enthalpy with respect to temperature, then the heat equation um, can be written as um, volumetric heat capacity times, um, times change in temperature with time, the phase change term, um, um, a change in fluxes with height, where um, the volumetric heat capacity um, is um, defined actually as the um, change in the enthalpy, change in the temperature component of, en of enthalpy. Um, with temperature. And then we can also combine these um, two terms on the left um, to write the heat equation in terms of apparent heat capacity, where um, the, um, we've just combined the two terms on the, on the left, um, where the apparent heat capacity is defined as the change in enthalpy um, with respect to temperature. Um, so this is, this is where we run into um, some pretty major problems here. So we can have a conservative discretization of the enthalpy form of the heat equation. Um, change in enthalpy over a time step is equal to the net fluxes at the boundaries of the control volume um, um, divided by um, the um, depth of the control volume. And this can be represented in terms of temperature um, using the apparent heat capacity that I showed before. So the apparent heat capacity times the change in temperature with time um, is equal to the same right hand side as we had before. Um, but the problems that we run into with energy conservation is that um, we've got the conservation condition for energy um, defined as um, where the um, apparent heat capacity um, must be equal to um, the change in enthalpy um, with respect to the change in temperature over, over, over a model time step. And what we actually see in, in models is that the um, um, volumetric heat capacity or the apparent heat capacity is calculated as a, at a specific point in the time step. And um, this conservation condition is um, typically not satisfied. So a lot of land models that we have you know, don't actually conserve energy. Um, if I um, finish, uh, finish up a little bit, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, some of the LAF tests um, that we've been developing to ensure that our model equations have been implemented correctly. Um, so LAF tests, um, some people call these synthetic test cases or functional unit tests, and they evaluate the implementation of the model equations, including the impacts of the numerical approximations. And they provide the most rudimentary test of the model capabilities. 
So our point is that if a model fails a laugh test, then it's difficult to seriously consider using the model and applications. So one laugh test here is um, infiltration into, into dry soil. Um, so this is um, a um, synthetic case that was introduced by Celia in 1990 when he um, did talked about his um, mixed form of Richards equation. Um, so the figures, are, the figures in the right is what we solve with 100 soil layers and we can compare these figures to, you know, a lot of Richards equation papers that have been published previously. Um, the animation on the left is from Kevin Green, and that's just showing that if you have an adaptive spatial mesh, you can um, get 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 away with um, um, a lot fewer layers in the in the spatial discretization. Um, another laugh test is steady state flux in a layered soil profile. Here we've got analytical solutions of the pressure head profile, and we can check that our model simulations you know match these analytical solutions. Um, another laugh test is water movement through snow. Um, so this is three hours of um, rainfall um, over a one meter snowpack and um, that's initialized in different ways um, to ripe snow, refrozen snow and fresh snow. Um, so we extended the analytical solution of Colbeck 1976 so that we could have um, analytical estimates of volumetric liquid water content at every point in space and time. We're able to um, compare those um, with the model simulations. And then we're also able to compare um, the outflow um, from the one meter snowpack um, for these different cases um, against, against the model um, simulations to give us confidence that we have implemented the equations correctly. Um, we also have a cryosuction um, test case. Um, so this is um, a lab column experiment where um, 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 different soil columns were subject to freezing from above and um, removed from um, um, the laboratory after 12 hours, 24 hours, 50 hours, etc. So this is able for us to, to check that, um, that our model um, simulates the migration of water um, towards the freezing front. So as the summary for the laugh tests, um, we've kind of got three different types. One is where we can compare to simulations from other papers. The second is where we can compare to analytical solutions. And the third is where we can compare to lab experiments. Um, these synthetic test cases, um, we we'll consider them laugh tests because they provide the most rudimentary test of, of, of the model capabilities and enable us to, to check that everything's implemented correctly. So I'll pause there and um, stop sharing and pass over to Ray, who will um, provide a bit more of a broader perspective as well. Oops, okay. I'm just going to pick out my, uh, which screen to share here. So in the meantime, I'll thank Martin for the excellent overview. Um, are we, okay, I need to, I want to go to full screen. So I hope that that looks good to everybody. Please let me know if not, you can hear me well, I assume. So yeah, uh, without further ado, let me go right into it. So following up on the theme of numerical issues in land models, I'm gonna speak from the perspective of a numerical analyst. So I'm Raymond Spateri, I'm a professor in the Department of Computer Science here. I appreciate your time and <laughs> patience, uh, indulgence with hearing me out. A brief introduction, focusing on the issues, and at the end there is a bit of space for vision that I'm going to postpone until after Reza and Janine speak. So I'm a numerical analyst. What does that mean? It's a fair question to ask. So I'm interested in the study of algorithms, okay, for problems of continuous mathematics, and this is meant to be as opposed to discrete mathematics, like combinatorial problems and things like this. I'm not really into that, although of course everything that is done on a computer in a floating point framework is really a discrete problem, but the underlying mathematical problem is continuous. It is mostly um, a differential equation, often a partial differential equation. So um, my job is to run the gamut of issues. So starting from the theory, so I mean, numerical analysis maybe only talks about the algorithms, but I'm interested in everything in the sense from A to Z in the sense that I'm interested in the theory that the algorithms are based on. I'm interested not just, but not just stopping there and proving theorems, but to go on beyond that and implement things in software. Um, and again, 
implementing things in software in a way that we can demonstrate that they actually make a positive difference. There are plenty of ways to do all of these three jobs poorly and claim you've done them, but we want you know, to do better than that. Um, so, you know, the, the job here is for, you know, me to take you from A to B, okay? So um, A is what I call the model, which is what I call, which is what I call the equations, or I look at them as the equations. That is separate from the method that gets you to point B, which is the output from the simulation. So, you know, the issue of, well, I have a poor model, so I'm going to do a poor job of approximating it, and that's going to be okay, to me boils down to the argument that two wrongs make a right. So um, further than that, um, I think, so you can make that argument because I won't say that sometimes that's not true, but then, you know, if you do end up with a right, you're also making the argument that uh, you, somehow that you've gotten the right answer for the right reason. And again, I think it's even harder than to justify that position if you're making um, this kind of, of argument. Um, my job is to basically say, you know, look, this is what your model says in a faithful way. I'm not fudging it. You know, you've given me the model in a way and I say, here's what your model is saying. Now, if you're not happy with that answer, then you can change your model. Um, of course, if <laughs> I could possibly change my numerical method, but um, not if, of course, not if I have confidence that it is reflecting what the model is saying. And that's, that's really my job, to be an honest broker in that sense. So some of the things that we're doing in hydrology right now, we spent a lot of time working with the Canadian hydrological model, in particular, making it into a fully distributed code, which I'm not going to call massively parallel yet, but it's sort of on the way to that. Uh, a few other things that we've been doing that I'm not going to talk about, we've also put in these lookup tables uh, in CHM to evaluate, you know, the repeated evaluation of complicated functions and that kind of thing in itself um, sped the code up by like 20%, uh, which again can be significant. We think about run runs being quite long, so 20% is significant. And we have a library that essentially can, you know, apply the same idea of generating these lookup tables essentially to any piece of code, especially if it's in C++. Um, we've been trying to incorporate Sundials, which is a generic third-party solver for ordinary differential equations, differential algebraic equations into SUMA. That's what Reza is going to be speaking about. One of the things that's sort of more on the future to-do list is the, the marriage um, of CHM and SUMA, where we're getting the two you know, massively complicated, in a way, pieces of software so that they can work together. Um, some of the other work that we've done that I just wanted to put a quick plug-in is the uh, Western Digital Elevation Map Ponding Model. Um, because we've done some multi-GPU parallelization, it's sort of, it was a fun thing and the results are fairly new. This is work done with Kevin Shook and my master student, uh, Leo. Um, so you take a DEM and you want to know where the water goes. And there was some previous work um, where we did, you know, first of all, sort of OpenMP shared memory parallelization. Then we went to one GPU, but then recently um, we've gone to multiple GPU and here's sort of a flow chart as to how that works. You kind of have to divide the domain up and give you know each part of a different domain to a different GPU. And you kind of might say, well, why would you want to do that? And part of the reason is because, um, well, first of all, it's faster, but second of all, it's, it would be much faster than somehow using one GPU where there's a lot of sort of memory transfer uh, between the CPU and that one GPU. So just as a quick note of, of what's been done, um, when we first started, you know, the, 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 the DEMs were quite small. You know, you could run it on a CPU in say 20 minutes. There's really not, you know, it's nice that with one GPU that got down to eight seconds for sure. Um, but this problem again is too small. You see that if four GPUs actually took four times as long to run. Um, but once you get into some kind of, you know, serious, um, serious size DEMs, you know, the, the, seri the serial code would take 12 days. And yeah, it was a great thing with 32 CPUs if you could get yourself on a, uh, on a really good uh, processor or node, you can get the 12 days down to 12 hours. But, you know, with four GPUs, we can get that down to one hour. And again, I don't really know anybody who would say that they would prefer to wait 12 hours as opposed to one or even three. 
So this, and, and of course the differences get even larger. The 12 day run is really not a big deal. Some of the DEMs and some of the runs that we projected uh, to be made could take you know, a year to run. So the issues as Martin has somehow um, alluded to, I'm interested in the issues of accuracy. How do you know your answer is right? A one-off run with a constant step size and one method really means you have no idea how correct that answer is. And so um, we have to be careful when there are discontinuities in, in the models, and I've seen a lot of them in the flux parameterizations, right? These if-then statements in the code are bad. Uh, if you want to understand, if you want to be sure that you're getting, you know, doing the right thing. Issues such as conservation of mass and energy and positivity. Janine will say something more about that uh, when it comes to glaciers. Uh, of course, we're interested in uh, the efficiency of the code. In other words, we can't have it take any longer than it has to. Um, and robustness. In other words, we want one code to be able to solve um, many different problems. So Reza will talk a little bit about solving uh, using SUMA to solve um, over, you know, the enti entire North America. You can't be able, you can't tweak every, you know, every site, your code to, to deal with every site due to its sort of if, um, intricacies. So here's sort of the main uh, team that's been working on parallelization, distributed parallelization of CHM. So I threw this on there so that you can sort of see what we looked like before this project started. Um, here's how we view CHM. So CHM, its features really boil down to a, a nutshell that it represents the surface in terms of triangles to capture the heterogeneity. And it also is, it offers a plugin architecture to be able to incorporate all the different processes that you want. And here is sort of a watered down version of a horrendogram, if you will, in terms of um, what it looks like to do a simple or sort of straightforward blowing snow simulation. So when you do uh, the, the salient issues, when you're trying to do a distributed computation like this is, you know, you've, you have to somehow figure out a proper way to order the mesh because it makes a big difference in terms of um, performance. How do you do the linear algebra? So how do you solve, you know, AX equals B, where A is a big matrix, where not every, where every processor doesn't have access to all of A. And another um, very important practical aspect, it's really not numerical analysis uh, per se, it's about input output. Um, you know, again, how do you read the mesh in? How, you, how do you distribute it? How do you process the output in parallel? Like these are all things that make a difference in practice. And that's what I, when I said, you know, we're running from A to Z, we're looking at everything, right? Because we want, we, it's no good for me to say, well, I have the best algorithm for solving the differential equations, but my code takes a really long time because it's stuck, you know, printing. Here are just a quick summary of, of some of the things that we did in the past. So uh, we have a couple of simple benchmark problems um, where, you know, here the performance in blue is with the shared memory, uh, system. Uh, as soon as we went to distributed memory, it allows you to solve bigger problems and it allows you to solve them faster. And so, you know, we have, this is good scaling, like so the straight line is ideal scaling, which means you can't, it's really impossible to make the code run faster than it does. And for example, if you have two processors, then it's impossible to get the code to run more than 50% faster. So in this case, our scaling is, you know, quite good. Um, so you know, 1.7 speed up in jumping from two nodes, which again, the perfect it would be two. So 1.7 is pretty good. Um, when we went to 16 nodes, we got a 12 times speed up, although that's a bit overstated because the cores were actually a bit better. Uh, here's another laugh test, which is again, a, a simple, simple problem where we took an eight hour computation and reduced it to half an hour um, using 16 threads and 14 nodes and two processes per node. The funny rainbow figure there is an illustration of where the different parts of the domain are stored per, um, per node. So not all the blues mean one node, but the, the stripes kind of mean this is how the mesh ended up being distributed on the various nodes. Um, the latest thing basically just shows that um, we have these runs using Snowcast that um, scale essentially perfectly. So at 97% to using all the nodes available on Copernicus. So again, you can shave a nine and a half hour computation down to eight and a half hours, which might not sound like a big deal, but the increment in 
in, in computing power is also uh, modest. It's just to show that things are still working at this level, which is not always um, a given with a given system. And this has 5.6 million triangles on it. So this is where I'm going to stop. Um, the vision uh, part, I guess we'll come back to at the end. So I will stop here. Um, here is all the people on the team in case I don't get a chance to do this later. And I will stop sharing and turn it over to Reza. Hello, are we good? Raisa? Yeah. Yep, yeah, I'm yeah. trying to share my screen. Uh, do you see my screen? Yep, that's perfect. I'm getting some feedback. Okay, what about now? Um, still some, but um, I think we just need to keep going. Oh, okay. Okay, uh, hello everyone, my name is Reza, I postdoc at the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, my background is numerical analysis and software development. Um, okay, as uh, Martin mentioned, uh, we solve a coupled energy and mass equ equations on four subdomains, canopy, aerospace, uh, vegetation, snow and soil. Um, first, we need a kind of spatial discretization. In SUMA, we uh, have one uh, vegetation layer, some snow layers, and some soil la layers. After a spatial discretization, we uh, come up with a system of differential algebraic equations. In many cases, it's just an implicit ODE system, but in general, we consider it as a DAE system, where uh, you see in this form, we have uh, Y as the state vector containing all of the state va variables. We have temperature. Yeah, um, um, Reza, um, the feedback is terrible, actually. I'm wondering um, if Ray can just talk to your slides. Uh, okay, sure. Yeah, let, let's try that. So, um, okay, whoops. Okay, so yeah, so we'll be solving, you know, a, what is called a differential algebraic equation system um, by putting all of the unknowns together into one vector. So we've got temperature in the various subdomains, we've got snow uh, temperature and, and mass in the various layers of the snow and similar for the soil. Um, and we have some constraints that we need to respect as well in terms of the range of the variables. Okay, next slide. Um, here, I think we're showing, just a second here, let me see. Um, this is gonna be, oh, I see, okay, yeah. So this is, so again, wondering, you know, one of the first questions again that I ask people is, you know, you, they come with a numerical solution is how do you know you're right? And so um, SUMA would use, you know, backward order with a certain time step. And so one of the things that we did was say, okay, what's the difference between that and when, when we reduce the time step by a factor of 32? So here you've got a graph in blue, which is the original, and graph in red, which is the refined one. And you can see that there are differences between the two. And especially in the, in the first um, graph in terms of uh, uh, snow water equivalent, right, that Again, so for me as a numerical analyst, and we always you know, bring this up, it's like, you know, is that difference okay or not? Uh, that's not for us to 
uh, judge. It is, you know, our, again, job is only, this is what your model is saying. And you can see there are various, you know, the second plot is, is uh, um, per se, like for the absolute differences. And then there are some other things. Um, so yeah, go ahead to the next slide. Um, here is another um, a plot of differences. So again, when you have a lot of different um, places in North America, you can find them where they're quite different. So here you've got, you know, although the trend is the same, the difference is somehow significant and constant. And again, is this okay? I don't know myself, um, but it, this is what your model is saying. Okay, next slide. So in order to make the, um, the process of, of solving these equations robust, we've introduced sort of a well-known um, solver called Sundials, which is the suite for nonlinear and differential algebraic equation solver. It is made up of three different packages, Kinsol, Sievold, and Ida, that solve nonlinear algebraic equations, ordinary differential equations, and DAEs respectively. Go ahead. Uh, the integration method is known as uh, backward differentiation formula, which are implicit methods. The first one of this is with the backward Euler. It's variable order, so to be efficient, the code will change the method that it uses. Um, the robustness here is that, you know, the code estimates the error and adapts the step size accordingly. This leads to efficiency because you're always using the largest step size that you can get away with for the tolerance that you're interested in. And what has to happen um, from the user is that they need to define the residual vector or the, the left-hand side of the differential equation. This is the thing that should be zero, but it's not. And a Jacobian matrix that's used to solve a nonlinear system of equations that arises at each step. So go ahead, Reza. The next, um, the, the issue then is how to get all this stuff into SUMA that already does things in a certain way. And here um, we show the, the, um, the difference between what Ida gives you, so what Sundials gives you right away versus backward Euler 32. And you would assume that backward Euler 32 is more accurate than just backward Euler with 32 times the step size. And you can see visually that the, math, the solutions match right on. And the difference between the two is very small. So again, even as somebody who doesn't know anything, looking at this and saying, well, these differences are much smaller, surely that is better than what we had before. Okay, next, is there anything else further? Right, so you can see that even in the areas where, you know, backward Euler 32 did not agree with backward Euler, SUMA sundials does agree with, the sundials does agree with the, uh, with Ida. So <laughs> if you're hinting at me to say something else, I'm not getting it right now. But um, so yes, yeah, so right now we're working, so this is a tough problem. Um, we're working on running the code over the, um, all of North America. So half a million um, HRUs here. And again, a couple of challenges with automating this. One is how do you submit all these batch jobs um, and that's what we have our, uh, we have a summer student, Kyle Klink, who's gonna be joining us in the master's program in September. He's working on using something called actors in order to do this. So it's a very adaptable way to um, have the process, you know, continue so that it's not, you know, one failure doesn't, doesn't stop the whole, the whole, the whole job. Um, but also, you know, the various, again, for those of you in the field, you understand that the, the, the conditions are very different between all of these HRUs. And so having one solver solve them all um, with one set of settings is probably a lot to ask for. So we are you know, looking into again, how to adapt and, and change these things uh, automatically based upon observation. So I better stop because we need to move to Janine. So I'm stopping here. Let me just share my screen. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go through this fast since we only have a couple minutes left. Um, so my research is on improving numerical simulations of glacier flow. Um, 
glaciers are important because uh, regionally the runoff from them contributes to water availability um, and they're on a global scale the molten contributes to rising sea levels. Because of this better modeling of glaciers in particular mountain glaciers where my research is focused currently is essential so that the impacts of warming climate can be planned for. Um, glacier flow is where my research is concentrated on. Um, the Current methods of modeling it are using Stokes equations or the shallow ice approximation. Stokes is a differential equation that includes all the dynamic flow terms. Um, it's not generally considered practical over large domains over large time periods because of the computational resources required. Uh, the approach that is generally used in larger models is the shallow ice approximation. Um, which assumes that the ice is shallow and that vertical shearing motion dominates over horizontal stretching and shearing. Uh, it's generally accurate over, accurate over the interior of the glaciers, but along the edges of the glaciers, mass is not always conserved. Um, so the standard method for solving the shallow ice approximation is done by rewriting equation one as a diffusion problem, which would mean substituting in for Q uh, the gradient of ice times the surface elevation S, and then applying a finite difference time stepping differential solving method to update the value um, of S creating equation two. Uh, this method deals with our boundary condition of the ice height having to be greater than zero always um, by using equation three, which clips the results, setting negative values of ice thickness and surface values back to zero. The problem with this method is that when applying it to areas where the ice is thin and the terrain is steep, it can spontaneously create mass. Um, this is because the spatial discrimination scheme appropriate for solving diff diffusivity problems can generate negative values of ice thickness and steep terrain. Since the gradient ice surface elevation is now dominated by the slope of the bed. Um, there have been methods written to an attempt to improve the shallow ice approximation, such as by Hiroshinal, who, and um, Clark, uh, but these often fail when applied to non-benchmark solutions of the model or when applied to glaciers with complex topography. Uh, current numerical solutions to the shallow ice approximation are therefore insufficient from accurate glacier flow modeling. And so the goal of my research is to address how does the numerical method of solving the shallow ice approximation affect conservation of mass? Um, to implement this research, um, my first step is to create a model, uh, explore alternative numerical solution methods um, for the shallow ice approximation. And then for validating my model, I'm going to reproduce the results from Hiroshinal and compare my results to it. Uh, the figure on the right is the reproduction from Hiroshinal's model. Um, and then I am going to compare with exact solutions for a benchmark um, bed. And then for my second uh, benchmark, I'll be using mass uh, balance results from the cold region hydrological model or SUMA uh, from either Athabasca or Pedo Glacier to determine um, the results. Uh, and this will hopefully lead to an improved method of solving the shallow axis approximation and a more realistic model of glacier flow. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent, that's great, Janine. Thank you, and thanks, Rosa. Hey, uh, Ray, do you want to go to your final slide on vision? Um, so yes. that we could just maybe ha have that up and go to, go to questions while that's up. Yes, I will. So here we are. Okay. So yes, the vision um, is to keep error control front and center for reliability and adaptability of the codes. Again, for robustness, we're interested in efe efficiency because efficiency sometimes makes the difference between the computation actually being feasible or not. Um, we're interested in a, what I'm calling A to Z massive parallelization, which means you start with the theory, the algorithms, but then you also go on to the software, the middleware, which is the sort of the things that, again, how do you control you know, what the operator system, operating system is doing into the hardware. So we're interested in maybe even moving to what are called FPGAs, which are 
devices you can program yourself to do certain computations. Um, and as well, the automation of all this, because again, with half a million you know, nodes, for example, you can't be in there messing with every one that doesn't work. Um, and I, I've been sort of trying to characterize this as what I call deep collaborating as opposed to deep learning, even though there is a lot of learning in what we're doing. Um, but of course, that expression has been taken already. So deep collaborating in the sense that, you know, the people on the team don't necessarily, they're not experts in, in, in everything. And, you know, people are going to have parts of the project where they just don't really know what's going on to the same extent. But again, that's fine. We shouldn't be afraid of that. Um, because, you know, that's how I think true progress, that's the only way I really can see that, you know, you can make true progress that could not be made um, individually. So that, those are the closing comments I have. Martin, I don't know if you want to add anything from there. No, that's good. Um, I think it would be nice to leave a little bit of time for questions. Um, because I think we, we already spoke longer than we were supposed to. Yeah, true enough. So there are some of the other people you can blame for this, um, it, which should include Janine, but I didn't get a picture of her in time. So rather than put up a picture of a cat, I thought I would just do this. Okay, uh, thank you all the speakers. Uh, that was indeed a very informative and intriguing presentation. Uh, now we'll be moving towards question and answer session. Uh, I see there is one question from Diego, which has already been answered. And uh, I don't see any other open question at the moment, uh, but I can start with uh, a curiosity that I have. So I'm just uh, curious to get your thoughts on what we can do as a community to promote you know, numerically robust practices. I mean, each of us can do more uh, due diligence and probably other things that we can do individually, but as a community, what should be our collective priorities uh, to promote uh, numerically robust practices? So Martin, do you want to try your stab first? Yeah, I can, I can take a stab at this first. And other areas of core modeling, we've been talking about community modeling rather than developing a community model. So it's more developing a community of practice that enables us to share code and concepts more effectively across different model development groups. And what that requires is that we're building software ecosystems that have much more modularity or much much better modularity than, um, than the way that models were constructed in the past. So an example is that we've got modularity at the level of individual fluxes um, that compute the flux and the derivative of the flux with respect to the relevant state variables. So those can be used as building blocks and other models. Um, another example is um, hierarchical modeling um, strategies, which uh, being incorporated in the next gen theme that John Pomeroy is leading um, so that we can more effectively um, bring in different building blocks um, from alternative models um, into you know, a community ecosystem again, so that everybody can still have their, their, their own model and different models for different applications, um, but we can um, more effectively share you know, the work that's being done in, in other model development groups. Um, for the numerical implementation, um, I think part of the issue is awareness and um, identifying areas in the model that may be unstable or um, causing, causing problems and being able to address those. When we're bringing this to the next level, um, I think what we will see in 10 years time is that the next generation of models will have clean separation of the physics from the numerics that enables the use of third party solvers. I think it's pretty clear from um, what we're doing, we're leading the charge in some respects and what I see is happening in the US um, that that's definitely where the train is going and that um, we're going to be moving away um, from homegrown numerical solutions um, from physical scientists and um, more being able to take advantage of um, established methods for numerical analysis that have been developed by the applied math community. Um, Ray, Sorry. anything to add to that? Yeah, no, not really. It's, it's, it's all about, you know, make awareness and, and you know, sharing you know, having a common code base or at least code that's accessible to others. I think I won't add more than that. Uh, there's another question from Andrew Irison, and I think it's for Ray. So how much does Sundial slow down SUMA? How much does it slow down SUMA? Oh, that's a very good question. So depends on how you do the comparison. Um, if you want to run Sundials versus backward Euler with sort of the original time steps that were used previously, it's about 1.6 times slower, so less than half. However, um, the accuracy of that 
solution is often questionable. So to get the guarantee of a good solution, you would either have to run backward order with 16 or 32 or 64 times uh, the smaller step size as previous. And so paying 50% you know, more to get a guaranteed accurate solution is really quite a cheap price. So, uh, and we haven't maybe optimized everything to the settings yet either. So I would say it's a little more expensive, not a lot, but it's certainly, you know, what you get in, in, in exchange for that expense, I would say is quite, quite valuable. Uh, another related question is, uh, it's from Anonymous. So uh, these numerical differences you showed can be very large. Uh, to what extent does this compound over long-term simulations? Can you give some thoughts on how long-term simulations may change with different or better numerics? Oh, well, that's definitely true. So even with the best numerics, uh, the errors do accumulate over time. There's nothing really you can do about, well, I shouldn't say nothing, but there's sort of a different approach to solving problems. Like as an initial value problem, you take the state, you know at a given point, you move to the next step and you essentially throw away the past information. So if you're gonna do that, um, then an error will tend to accumulate. But again, the idea is that with the error control that you will be able to control it to some extent. So it won't get away from you the same way that a fixed step size would. Really the problem there is that the error does accumulate and it can take off on you and you'll never actually know. So the, the other way to do it actually would be to take what I would call a boundary value approach to the solution where you actually do have to try to, solve, to store the solution for all times all space and all time, and that would allow you to do refinement in time where you need to. Um, the, the deal with the initial value problem throwing the solution away is that if you make an error a long time ago that was too big and is coming back to bite you now, there's no way for you to go back in time and take a smaller step size back then. Whereas with a global solution, it's much more memory intensive. There is a lot of work going on in there, but it does allow you to say, okay, it's not very accurate in here. Let me refine over here and let me refine over there. And eventually then you can give some kind of guarantees on what we call the, the global error as opposed to just the local error. So I hope that that wasn't too technical and made some sense. Thanks. Uh, it's a final comment or question for, for our session today. Uh, it's from Diego and he says, it is fantastic to see us in uh, in hydrology finally using and respecting the hundreds of years of research on numerical analysis. Uh, this is core to fields with con continuous mediums, uh, example hydrodynamics. But the piecemeal nature of the hydrological models has made things a less clear how how to address. Uh, any comments on that? Yeah, I can maybe start with this. Um, so. It can be an enormous undertaking um, to take an existing legacy model and um, renovate it or recode it or refactor it um, so that you've got full separation of the physics and the numerics. So this is something that I ran into when I was at NCARP when we were talking about improving the numerical solution in the community um, terrestrial systems model, um, the next generation of um, the community land model. That was a huge, huge piece of code. Um, so the approach that we did there is that we started with local solvers is that we went into each individual process in the model and said, okay, um, let's build a local solver so that at least at the local level, at least um, for our given model component, we've solved the equations more accurately. And then we're gradually um, building up from there. Um, so the approach was really to just um, pick things off in bite-sized chunks in, in order to um, improve the numerics of an existing model. Um, this is an area, I think, um, of model renovation that relates to some of the work that Kevin Schneider has been doing. And um, Kevin Schneider has been doing some work on um, the renovation of, of CRIM. So I'm not sure if that feeds back onto there, Diego. So maybe we can circle back on this later. You know, I will only add, I, I thank Diego for the comment. It's not an exaggeration that it's been around for hundreds of years because Euler's method was, you know, done the late 1700s was when, was when Euler was around. Yeah, and this is a final comment from Andrew Ison that says, uh, thanks all this work is so exciting. I love the process. And I think uh, with this, we come to the end of this webinar. Uh, thank you all, again, all the speakers. And I also thank, I want to thank everyone that attended this webinar. The video recording of this webinar will be available uh, later today in Core Modeling website. Uh, just a note that there will not be a webinar next week due to the Global Water Futures Annual Science Meeting. 
uh, but we'll be returning with exciting line of speakers in the following week. So please stay tuned. Uh, that will be all for today. Uh, thank you again and please stay safe. I wish you a good day. Yeah, thanks everyone.